Well, well, thank you all. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, John. You, you folks are so lucky to have this place. I just want, just want to let you know for, you know, growing up here, I, you know, this this was always such a special place to be. Um, my mother went way out of her way to make me appreciate it, as everything that we're going to be talking about today was stuff that she made me do, make me know about. <laughs> so mothers are like that. But uh, it's, it, it is truly a true, true gem. So you're very, very, very fortunate to have this right here. It, in, in some ways, it's a little bit odd. I, I never thought I would uh, come in an age that I would be an exhibit. <laughs> But I, I guess that's what happens if after a while. But anyway, uh, just uh, reconnected with an old friend, uh, Ken, over here, who's, uh, we grew up, grew up together, and we haven't seen each other in, what, 50 years? And we used to prowl these waterfronts. And, it, and, uh, many, and many of you folks have, who've lived here many, many years knew what, th what this was like here. This, uh, the waterfront is, of course, much cleaner and, uh, and the water is much clearer. But what is missing from our memory is that informal, um, probably the world's longest informal maritime museum that stretched all the way from here, all the way up through Bayonne and wrapping around the top of the island. And as kids, we, that's kind of what we did. We were prowled around on the docks, on the boats, and rafting to them, uh, rowing to them, taking power boats to them, be being chased off of them. And, uh, but it was a wonderful place to be. But what we really didn't think about was that what we were experiencing and in our own way was we were visiting the ghosts of Staten Island's and Tottenville's shipyards. It, it, was, it, was, it was ghosts, you know, sunken schooners, canal boats, uh, barges, tugboats, lighters, and it was just an amazing place to, to grow up in. But you know, as a kid, you don't kind of connect the dots, except for some young people are into history. But, the, uh, but when you think about it, there is no reason why this wouldn't have been the land of shipyards. It is the, the placement of it is perfect for, for so, so many so, so many reasons. I took some notes here. I hope you don't mind. I've got a, got a good memory, but it's short, so I don't want to leave anything out. But the, uh, the Tottenville had uh, direct access to the world, basically. When you think, you think about where, where this place is located, you have, of course, all the waters of the harbor and, the, and New York Bight. You had the, the Atlantic. You had, to the north, you have the Hudson. You had access to the Chesapeake uh, via the Rar Raritan River and the DNR Canal, taking it down the Delaware River and, and going through the canals down there. And you could go everywhere and you could come from everywhere. The resources were all handy as well. Part of it was because of, of rail, that you could get the woods. And these were, of course, at this, at, on this end of the island, wood was what people built with. So there was the oaks from Pennsylvania and the, and the, the yellow, yellow pines from the south, uh, locusts from probably New England, and they could all be brought in by, by rail. Indeed, uh, that's how it, that's how it would, would be brought in. And they, they would bring it on, they'd come down the rapid transit and be unloaded. Those great big keel sticks, those hulks that you saw down in the waterfront there, they would be unloaded at Atlantic, at Atlantic Station and be, be brought by horse through town to, to, the, to, the, to the shipyard. So it, it's, you know, it, it's, the resources were there. Over in Perth Amboy, there was uh, foundries where they could cast anything, like things like that uh, cleat over there, for example. They could, be, uh, they could make the patterns here and send them over to Perth Amboy, and they would make it, and then in-house, in all these, most of the shipyards, they had, uh, their, their uh, craftsmen there, whether it's the pattern makers, whether the sail makers, whether it's the blacksmiths, they were, they were all right there. So the, the, and, and, and most importantly, they had this really spunky and talented bunch of people. Tottenville and Staten Island as a whole, but Tottenville especially, 
had was a, 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 a community of skilled mechanics, people who would build things. There was a lot of awful lot of pride in what they 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 did, and uh, so you know all all the stuff was here. But wait, there's more. The uh, you know you could have this sort of same sort of thing maybe in Topeka, Kansas, but you know. Uh, it wouldn't be quite the same. Here we had the uh, the topography was working for us. As as you as you know, when you go walk this beach at low tide, it's a low sloping grade. Perfect for for uh, you know there's there's there are open areas that you could have a shipyard. You don't have to level things. It was it was naturally there. You have a long sloping grade that allows you to to launch and have docks but you have easy access to deep water. So it was, it was just uh, you know, a perfect location to have a shipyard. You know, I mean, a lot of places, they have to invent, try to invent something like this. This, was, this is, was right here. That's why from all the way from Ward's Point, all the way up towards where the Outer Bridge Crossing is now, there was shipyard, 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 all the way along with all, all their specialties that they did. And uh, then the other thing was that you could have all this stuff and be far uh, too far away from, from people. You had easy access to places like Philadelphia and to uh, New York, and yet you, the town, and there was a town, that's the way you have to think of it, was not part of those places. It was, it was, it was an independent place where people who worked and were not part of, of, a, of a city type of thing that would kind of try to draw those skills away. So you had people who uh, were there to do the work. So in many ways, it was just a perfect location for all this. And I guess you know, there's a, where I work in the summertime in Maine, Brooklyn, Maine, spelled differently than the one that we have handy here. They call themselves the, the wooden, wooden boat capital of the world, but I kind of think that at one time this was. But, uh, but the research and, and, what, and what the article was about was about the A.C. Brown shipyard. And again, this is something my mother made me do. The, um, I've been working on it, oh gosh, for, well, uh, I, I was telling Carol here that I, uh, I had corresponded with her in 1985 and a lot of other people as well, family members, uh, Hel Helen Brown, uh, John Brown, uh, other, other family members as well. And I was uh, constantly accreting this information, photographs and stuff, and, and, and the, uh, the uh, Helen and Madeline Brown used to you know, bring this stuff over to my mother and said, oh, give this to Greg, he, he will, he'll like it. And, and so, I had a lot of stuff, but I was doing other things as well. And I kept, I communicated with the folks at Wooden Boat who had an uh, interest in it as well, but I never really got around to it. But one of the good things about this pandemic was I had extra time, <laughs> just by sheer serendipity. So finally, I had the time to go and do the research and get, uh, and get a hold of people while, you know, while, you know some of them were still alive, and a lot more stuff is now online as far as newspaper articles and clippings and things like that. So that's how it came about. But anyway, for the, uh, the Brown family is, is, was amazing. Uh, and, it, and it must have been in their, in their DNA, the, 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 because it wasn't just the family when they were here. Um, Abraham Christie, Christie Brown was the one who started the, the yard here but he learned the trade from his father, a Abraham Brown, and he, and he learned it from his father, Tunis Brown, and who had a, had a uh, shipyard in New Jersey in the late 1700s. And so this, all, the, all this knowledge was passed along from uh, father to son, the father to son. And uh, you know, so I, I really, I think it does get embedded into your, into your, into your bones. And, uh, well, so uh, I guess A.C. AC Brown, the, the son though, like, like every young person when they're a teenager, uh, I think uh, what I can read about is he kind of like wanted to get out of Dodge, you know, and, and get away from uh, building boats to sailing it. So he went to sea for a year and a half 
than when he was 17, which I think was really important because he was getting the knowledge to, uh, to actually see what worked and what was important. On, on a ship, you know, it's be like you know building a car if you never have driven one, building a house and you never lived in one. They, you know, it's use, using it is what uh, is I think taught him a lot of what was important, what wore out, what you know, what could be made stronger, what could be made better. So when he got done with that, he came, he he moved to uh, New York and he worked in a lot of different yards throughout, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know up in the northern part of the city area, and then finally came down here to, uh, to manage the Ellis Yard. And I, I guess it was maybe uh, 15 years or so, he became foreman of the Jacob S. Ellis Yard. And then he started his own yard down at the end of Amboy Road. And what, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Just I want, want you to uh, picture it. And, then we, and up in the house, if you go upstairs, you'll see the size of the shipyard on a map up there and what was there. We're only talking about three acres. You know, we, we, talk, we talk about all, all the acreage that we have in the park here. But I just that tiny, tiny footprint on the waterfront is what this yard was built on. But it was right on this, a nice prime area because you had Amboy Road coming in down there and you, and you did have access to all these things. But he set up his, his yard down there. And uh, again, his, uh, his experience it paid off. It, his stars aligned. Through, his, through the work that he'd done for, through these other yards, he got to be a known quantity. And he was, he was, um, and you know, he was affable. People liked him. He was honest. You know, he, he knew his business, and he, and he, and importantly, and sometimes it's less so these days. He knew what it was like to work for a living and work with his hands. So he had, and he would, you know, his man who would respect and understood what what it was like to actually do this work and and. Of course, his 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 employees understood that as well. And uh, yeah, interesting sort of a fun fact, and many of you may may have read about it. But most of the shipbuilding contracts that that he had, or, or the yard had, you know, in the, over the relatively short amount of time, just about sixty years, were all done by just the showing of the of the plans. From the uh, c from the contract, whether whether you were whether you were a tugboat company or whether you were U.S. government, they would give uh, the Browns the plans, and the deal was sealed with a handshake. And there, there was no none of these things of getting lawyers in and kind of quib quibbling about stuff. This is this is this is what's going to be done. This is what the price is going to be, and they knew exactly that they would get what they were pay paid for. So you know, you know, this is kind of a nice thing. Um, the uh, Ralph Monroe, Com Commodore Met Ralph Monroe, who was, uh, I love uh, very nice trees you have here, but they're giving me allergies. You have to excuse me on this. Uh, Commodore Ralph Monroe was probably the most uh, well-respected designer they worked with. That uh, any, uh, any of you folks are uh, familiar at all with, with. Uh, boat designers. There's only one designer that Nathaniel Harishoff ever felt was a rival or that he actually drew on was Ralph Monroe. He was just a, um, an amazing designer. And he d had a lot of his stuff built by, th by the shipyard. And what, what he, how he put it was, in, uh, as far as con boat construction, and he, not only yachts did he design, but things like uh, salvage boats and wreckers and dredgers. He said, it's a, matter, it's a matter of honor, said Monroe, and if there's any piece of the world where honor in construction is requisite, it is in the building of a wrecking tug. Here's a flavor of good old time honesty, is what, the, what his, uh, his opinion of the, the, the Brown family. And, and the family, this was a family, Family enterprise, because everyone, just about everyone, got involved with it. You know, it was, it was a three-ring circus of 
you know, people, you know, in the community, but the family was uh, there, the, the, the sons and daughters and, grand, uh, and grandchildren, they all, and the, this, this, this wasn't, uh, you know, feather bedding nepotism, they all were, were, were working in the, in the yard, and apparently they, they loved it as well. And I interviewed uh, John Brown, the grandson, that he just went on and on about what the pride and workmanship that everyone had in that family in, in building the, these vessels. So and so they you know they worked they worked in the office they were they were uh, they were designers they were were, were shipwrights they went uh, they were salesmen and they you know they would go out and and sell these boats and and uh, interesting also for the time because we're talking again in this, this period of uh, the 1870s to 1930 that it was a very progressive yard uh, and it was considered very much and that they they only they only worked. A five and a half day week, which was uh, unusual, and it wasn't these things where you're, you you know you keep you work till you drop. It, w it wasn't like that at all. It was uh, you work from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., which is what bo uh, boat yards uh, do in Maine now. I, actually, I've worked in other places that work longer than that, but it w but they were, it was about it was about family, and it was so it, it was you know a place to work, and they they paid. Well, it may not seem like much now, 98 cents an hour, which was good, good money in a time when, you know, like 20, 25 cents might be more of what you, what you, what you would get. And there, were, and, there were, and there were the local people. They, 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 um, though they had special jobs where they brought, brought in uh, rig, riggers from down east or uh, specialty stuff, most everyone worked in town or they would row across from Perth Amboy and they would arrive on their bicycles with their lunch pails and uh, that's what it was like. And it, and it was truly an amazing place. My, my mom uh, used to tell me, she's back again, uh, but uh, she told me what it was like being around the, this, the shipyard of things were just going there. It was, this, it was a steam plant there. There were, you know, there were compressors there. There were the steam vessels. There were, there was the, the ship, the great big ship saws, you know, you know, searing through the, that, that, you know, white oak timber and locust. And, and, you know, there was a, the people working in the, sh the shops. There wasn't very much in the way of electricity in the shop. The, the whole time that they, they ran that shop was almost, almost as though it was like in the, uh, 19th century. It was, it was sort of interesting, but it was a place to be, and there were just constant launchings. So you know, if you you know you sort of big, you, doing the math, if if you launched over 60 years, you launched three uh, 327 boats, big boats, not, not dinghies or anything like that. Big boats. You can see that there were a lot of stuff on the ways all the time. Plus, that's not counting the repair work that they did. And, uh, some of you folks used to, uh, who were down there might remember the old marine railway that they had, which was, you know, that would could run out into the river, and that's what they did the repair work is. They would, they, they would summon up a whole bunch of jobs, and they'd pull them all out at once. So it was new construction and repair all the time. And and part of the reason for the, the uh, success of the yard was its it's flexibility. They, didn't, you know, they weren't, you know, locked into just doing one thing. You know, a lot of yards, you know, say, okay, I've got this one model. That's all we're gonna do. If you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm Bath Ironworks, I just build destroyers. Uh, they, they would do all kinds of stuff. They, you know, the, um, the, you know, the period that they were booming a lot was during the Gilded Age. A lot of extra money kicking around, you know, with, with the railroad barons and Rockefellers and all, and, and you know, and, and there was a lot of stuff going on. So a lot, a lot of money was being exchanged and a lot of things were being built. So there was, there was ne need of tugboats to tow barges. There were barges to be towed. They, they needed tugs to wrangle steamers. They needed, uh, they needed uh, uh, wrecking tugs, they, you know, the ones that could uh, do salvage work, to, you know, because there were a lot of stuff, boats that were being sunk. There were passengers needed to be transported. They built, so I bet, built wooden passenger steamers for, for the old Dominion line. There, uh, there was, um, oh, 
ocean vessels needed pilots. They they built built uh, pilot boats for the New Jersey pilots and for the and the and the uh, Virginia pilots, both steam and and schooners. Uh, uh, telegraph needed uh, telegraph cables needed to be laid down. They built telegraph lay, laying vessels and. Um, and of course, uh, those those rich cats they needed their yachts, and they and they really did a grand job of them. If you want, uh, you can if you're ever wandering around on the internet, you can see what these these vessels were like. They were they were really well built, but they were were gorgeous. Some 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 of you folks might have seen the the work when they, the the two came to Tottenville, and that that was the kind of workmanship, just crisp, clean. Honest, no glitz or glamour, just just great construction. But wait, there's more. The the oysters, um, they they are the original living reefs, as they they say. They 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 this whole area. This was the how they used to say the nature documentaries. Fecund. There was a lot of st there were oysters everywhere. I've been going back back to the day, days of the. Of, of the Native Americans, and you know, they, you know, they brought a high price. I mean, they were they they basically there was a term that they used to use uh, uh, oyster millionaires, and there were people who made a lot of money selling these oysters. Uh, and the, the business, uh, a lot of this business ship, uh, shifted north uh, because of uh, the Civil War. You know, for uh, for a long time, they could just get oysters down south. They would just set them up after during the Civil War. It sort of sh uh, shifted up here, and they found that the, all this water, which at that time was really, really clean, they could clean up w with those tasty little bivalves. And so they did. And so someone had to build build the vessels for it. And whether they started off with with the the the, the schooners like the Lydia Van Name, whose bones still are off off the and off the shipyard today, uh, to uh, the oyster dredges, who you know they, who are still some of them are still working today, by the way, but they they made a lot of money building those those vessels, and the people working them made a lot of money. Uh, let's see, oh, but they're they're also worth I think getting back to the yacht business and and and. Rich people and boats. Uh, the Browns developed such a reputation that when uh, in the Adirondacks, the railroad barons up up in Blue Mountain Lake and and that uh, neck of the woods were tired of you know messing around with tiny little boats and and having to you know deal with canoes and things like that. They wanted powerful and and, and stylish vessels. So they they said. Oh, A.C. Brown, would you build us some vessels? Well, one one in particular, quite a large steam vessel, and which required them to actually move a portion of the yard up the Blue Mountain Lake. They had 230 miles north. They set up, they they took over an old boathouse there, raised the roof on it, and started started building up in there. That was the Tuscarora, which uh, there's a, there's a picture of it upstairs in the house right right here and known as a happy little ship an excursion vessel that, that was a prime transportation vessel for that part of the world and uh, and some of the family moved up there as well while this this whole operation was still working down here so it, you know it was you know again it was like this this fame and reputation sort of carried on to to um, even going up there so, but wait, there's more. So then, uh, even traveling farther, are you guys still okay? I mean, I can stop if you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I could go on for a really long time. I, but I'm, I'm almost out of paper. So, <laughs> but I, another fascinating story was that uh, about the Grenfell uh, mission. Grenfell uh, uh, mission. Uh, Dr. Grenfell had a medical mission up in Newfoundland and mostly in Labrador. And the, he had hospital ships, and they they came to Browns to to have a vessel built because even though it was a, a schooner, they were built. Uh, the, he needed a vessel that was built heavy, rugged, 
like the tugboats were. They, they, and you know, just, just sort of a sidebar in case you're wondering about wooden tugboats are extraordinarily strongly built. I mean, they're, they're almost like a solid block of wood. There's so many ribs or frames and stuff inside of them because of the work that they were doing. Well, when you're navigating among ice flows up in, you know, and, and icebergs in the north, you want something that can be very, very durable. So they came to him to build a boat, and they, and they, and they did. And shortly after, and there's, there's wonderful clippings about how they'd come, you know, they'd come to Perth Amboy and all these different things before, before they went up north. But shortly after they got up north, there was uh, a, an expedition to Greenland got in trouble. And the problem uh, was that apparently, and no one really nailed it down, but there are sus some suspicions that uh, Admiral Perry, in search of a little extra funding up, um, money, may have not really discovered a piece of land, but named a, a piece of land that he, that uh, after a potential donor. And so some people went up to try to find this place. And they got stuck up in, uh, in Greenland. And that, they needed to have a ship to run a relief mission up to there. And there's some wonderful pictures, I guess, up, in, up, up above here also. You'll see a picture of the, the, the brown-built Cluet, was the name of the ship, locked in ice and with, with sled dogs and, and people on the rigging and, and uh, these colossal glaciers in the background. But it came out fine because she was so ruggedly, ruggedly, ruggedly built. But of course, times were changing. Oh, you know, and a lot of the, and, and this flexibility really worked out for the yard for many, many, many ways. But, you know, things changed. The waters changed down here. You no longer could, you know, that those, uh, you know, that profitable oyster business, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to sell oysters when people are starting to get typhoid from them. It kind of, it kind of takes the edge off the market. And so eventually, the, the, the markets for oystering was, was, was closed, closed here. Uh, air pollution, which on a day like today, it's, it's hard to picture. But when we were kids, and Ken will remember, uh, and I'm sure you guys do as well, is that there, there was some, some industrial strength, industrial air pollution that was going on even in the 1920s. So much so that according to John, John Brown, uh, the uh, ship carpenter, was that they simply couldn't get the finish on the yachts because they were building primarily outside. So they, they then led them to, if, if, we can't do a, if we can't do a good job, we're gonna do something else. And that led them to focus more on your tugboats and your lighters and your, and, and your work boats that were, you know, basically were finished kind of like yachts, but they, were, but they weren't what, you know, you know, the Cornelius Vanderbilt type cats would be looking for. Uh, let's see. Oh, then, uh, then let's see. World War One showed up, uh, as as it did, and and that brought government contracts because they they were, they needed uh, tugboats and things to service service the military and the navy, and and so they were able to make make that. But um, they, you know, they I guess tugs tugs and barges were still their their meat and potatoes, and in between 1919 and 1931, they they still down in this yard down here, they still cranked out 42, 42 tugboats, which is a lot. But, um, you know, the wooden ships were, you know, they, in a lot of ways, you know, after World War I, the wooden ship construction, commercial ship construction was kind of running on vapors. They just, you know, steel was coming, coming in. They, uh, it was easier to maintain. Uh, uh, ship owners no longer were caring that much that they they had you know polished brass gong ball uh, gong boards inside the ship with lots of varnish work and a golden eagle on the top. They just wanted something that could do stuff. Uh, steam was being replaced by diesel, and so there was a whole shift that was going on in the business. And then of course, 
as we got into the you know, 1928, 1929, we got into the, the stock market collapse, the bank failures and the Great Depression, and the financing dried up. And it just, you, couldn't, you couldn't borrow money and you couldn't build anything for anyone because there were more, more tugs and lighters being put on the mud flats down here already. I mean, they were, they were all, uh, there already was a surfeit of vessels. So no one really wanted to have boats built for jobs that wouldn't be done. So the, the you know, the, the business sort of dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. So, it, so when it came to 1931, after the uh, launching of the Patrick J. McGurl and uh, fi the final vessel, the Walter L. Mazek, that was uh, hull number 327, New construction ceased. They just, the saw shut, da shut down. And the steam whistle that my mother so loved went silent. And the Tottenville mechanics no longer arrived by bicycle with their, with their mill, mill pails. And the, the yard set idle until after World War II, there was, there was a clipping in one of the commercial newspapers that someone was interesting interest in starting another shipyard there, a, a different kind, and that deal fell through. And shortly thereafter, in the, in the late 40s, the yard was, was leveled. But it's uh, the, uh, I guess you could say that like so many other businesses that were of that time, just, you know, things ran out. The time ran out, money ran out, the economy just all ran out. But it's still, was a remarkable, a remarkable place. Uh, it's you know a bit of, of your your history uh, that to recognize that of what people here were capable of, of doing. You know they made vessels that really really mattered. Uh, there, there are people. Uh, it was businesses that made people make money. They made employment. They also made a lot of local pride in in manufacture and craftsmanship. And that's, and, and remember, this is just one yard, and there were like all these other ones that went along here. So, you know, when you, when you walk along the beach, when you go down here, you'll see a stem of an old vessel still sticking up out of the water at low tide. You'll see, think, just think about that, that history that, that of the folks that went before us. And uh, just, you know, and think of the ghosts of the steam whistles and the, and the, and the ship saws and the, and the people with those, you know, those uh, adzes and, and smoothing planes and, and driving those wooden pegs in the side of the hull because they, they really are your, are your heritage. And anyway, well, I talked too long once again. I'm sorry. But if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them.